Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of Before Coffee. It is Thursdays 13. We're going to count down 13 things off a list. Words that are always together and never separate. And uh, so I hope you're excited exactly for that. Right, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it was. Well, you just told me during that one minute, so I already forgot. Well, let me tell. What? Well, let me tell then. Instead of okay. Anyway, this is Before okay. Coffee, the father and daughter and comprehensive news of Planet Earth podcast, where we look up our stories ten to fifteen minutes before we start, without any caffeine in our body. So let's look and see what we found out on those headlines. Today on Before Coffee, lost Picasso painting found in a basement in Italy. Uh, it's Thursday, all right, and we are going to look at the dock workers' strike in America. Georgian Parliament Speaker signs anti-LGBTQ law after President refused to sign it. And a little fun today for Thursday 13, we're going to look at 13 words you never see alone. In our culture news, what's behind the runaway success of French language music on Spotify? And it's National Boyfriends Day, October 3rd, 2024, on Before Coffee. That's all it is, sorry. Uh... Well, happy International or National Boyfriend's Day. I, oh, I should have looked up what International Day it was. Which I think I lost that page. Because it's not here. International. October, International Days. Today is the third. It's nothing. Yesterday was International Day of Nonviolence, though. So I guess I should have said something about that last time. Okay, for my first story, we're going to talk about a lost Picasso painting. A Picasso is somebody who needed to uh, practice nonviolence, I think, because he was famously a, an abuser and a sexist and all sorts of things. But hey, he made paintings and they're worth a lot of money. So somebody in Italy has hit it rich. This is from Gabrielle McKay on the Herald Scotland. A lost artwork found in an Italian basement by a junk dealer in the 1960s could fetch close to 5 million pounds at auction. The painting of Picasso's sometime muse and mistress, Dora Mar, was found rolled up against a wall in a cellar in Capri in 1962. In the top left was a signature, Picasso, but that meant nothing to its discoverer, junk dealer Luigi Lo Rosso, who took it home and hung it on his wall. Son Andrea Lo Rosso told Il Giorno. My first memory of the painting is my mother hung it on the wall at home, dubbing it the scribble because of the strangeness of the lady's face. It wasn't even I wasn't even born yet. I know my father's story is that he only got two paintings from the Capri cellar, but only one was assigned to Picasso. But we were covered with dirt and lime, so my mother put them on the ground and cleaned them with detergent like they were carpets. What a risk! My parents were simple people. They didn't know anything about art. In the 1980s, they had a restaurant in Pompeii, and to brighten up the garden, they had displayed it out there until a painter from Rome suggested he move it in case someone stole it. When I was still a kid, I saw an identical portrait in an encyclopedia called Buste de Femme Dora Mar. Literally, the, on the one who had one was only a copy. But as I grew up, I did some research and consulted with various experts. They told me to get verified because, after all, the painter spent many holidays in Capri in the 50s. One of those was the art historian and critic Vittorio Scarbi. Mr. Lo Rosso says, I spent the whole day with him and at the end of it, he pushed me to continue my research because no one could say in black and white that it was fake. He also warned me that I'd encounter no sorted of problems, and he was quite right. The painting was seized by the Carabinetti, Carab Carabinetti State Police on the ridiculous charge of receiving stolen goods. Above all, though, in Paris they wouldn't even give me the time of day. I went to the Picasso Museum in person with the artwork in the back of my car. They told me to stay outside and wait. Can you imagine? I went home with the painting. Damn French people! or well, Parisians. Damn Parisians! This, perhaps one reason for their re 
Caltrans is the fact that a Busta de Femmar already existed in the Picasso collection. Indeed, it sold for more than $22 million at, au at auction in 2016. Looks like they got scammed. Great money, money laundering success. According to the art researcher Luca Gentil Canal Marcante, though, they can both be in originals. They are probably two portraits, not exactly identical, of the same subject painted by Picasso at two different times. I'm sure of one thing, the one found in Capri and no, now kept in a vault in Milan is authentic. He certainly comes, his certainly comes from just from Zoe's expertise, but that of a range of experts. Did graphologist Cinzia Altieri compare the signature to the others by Picasso and found it to be a match? The chemical scientific analyst of, analyst of the artworks, Maurizio Ferracini, verified its age. Miss Altieri, who has examined works by Leonardo da Vinci, Salvador Dali, and Lucio Fontana, said, It is a very dense, old painting which, in the signature, has the same characteristics of autographs by Picasso. More verification came from Paolo Cornale of the CSG Palladio Chemical Lab, David Busalari of the Diagnostica per gli Fabri, and Franca Vitelli of the Vitelli Law Firm. He now will seek to have it verified by the Picasso Foundation before putting it up for auction. Mr. La Rosa said, I will auction it as my dad always wanted. Although sadly he passed away three years ago, that way, all the money spent on the expert reports would have been a good investment. So, congratulations, LaRoso, for finding a Picasso in their cellar and basically treating it like a normal junkyard painting for most of its life <laughs> without any indication that it's probably worth millions. As I said, you know, it could sell for up to, what did they say, like five million? could send and that's a lot of money maybe not as much as like some of those other paintings that are going for like hundreds of millions but five million could take you pretty far especially if you invest it well that's my story on paintings and sellers onto yours you're muted Loading, loading. Hello? Yep. There you are. There? Yep. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah. Hello, okay. Alright, I've been I had my mic off first and then I couldn't hear you and I guess we're good now, huh? Alright. Okay, back to the United States now. We're gonna talk about the massive port strike which could cause real problems in the United States. This is from CNN.com, Rama Shah Maruf. A massive port striker along the East Coast, East and Gulf Coast that kicked off on Tuesday has potentially become America's most disruptive work stoppages in recent times. The demands of the nearly 50,000 members of the International Longshoremen's Association Walking the picket lines remain at odds with the contract offers from United States Maritime Alliance or USMX. USMX represents the major shipping lines as well as terminal operators and port authorities. If we have to be put out here a month or two months, the world will this world will collapse, said ILO President Harold Daggett in an interview with CNN Tuesday morning. Go blame them, the USMX. Don't blame me. Blame them. The workers on strike have voiced real concerns with the future of their industry. The strikes which have stopped the flow of a wide variety of goods on the docks at almost all cargo ports from Maine to Texas also comes at a crucial time for U.S. elections. You can sum up the strike issues into words. Automation and wages. Port employees perform grueling and crucial work. Dock workers are rallying against growing trend amongst port operators to increase the number of cranes and driverless trucks, which use fewer humans to shuttle goods from container ships. The Longshoremen's Union is demanding airtight language that, that the ports won't introduce automation or semi-automation. The USMX is offering to keep its current contract language, which the union says is not strong enough. The ILA also wants a $5 an hour increase in pay for each of the six years of the next contract. 
or a 77% hike in total. The USMX said Monday it had increased its offer to more than 50% over the proposed six-year contract. Well, look at it this way. Uh, inflation might go up and that increase won't even be that great. You know, don't even know. However, there are, <coughs> that, that <coughs> the USMX said Monday it had increased its offer to more than 50% over the proposed six-year contract. That depends on how long the strike will go on. However, there are estimates. The one-week strike would cost the U.S. economy $2.1 billion, according to an estimate Monday from Anderson Economic Group. Most of that would be a $1.5 billion loss in the value of goods that couldn't be delivered on time, such as perishable goods. Transportation companies, including ship lines and ports, would lose $400 million in profit, while striking workers and those temporarily laid off would lose $200 million in wages. People are panic buying toilet paper, reports show on the media, reports on social media show, displaying empty store shelves where toilet paper and sometimes paper towels used to be. So people are already, first thing that goes is panic and panic buys is toilet paper because I don't know, people have running water in their houses. I don't know, I have no idea. But though people are likely ha harking back to the pandemic shutdown days, the strike at pet ports won't have any impact on the supply of these products. That's because the vast majority of US toilet paper comes from domestic factories. That's right, we don't import toilet paper, morons. When it does come up from abroad, it's usually trucked or travels from Canada or Mexico. If the strike drags on, you can expect some shortages on perishable items at, at the US imports. One of those is bananas. The U.S. reports 100% of its supply, more than half of the banana imports. America's most popular fruit by volume comes through the ports being struck as of Tuesday morning, according to the American Farm Bureau Federation. Yes, we have no bananas. There's your, there's your little song to play while you're striking. Unlike toilet paper, bananas go bad. So shippers weren't able to ship large volumes in advance of strikes. Other items at risk, cherries, cocoa, sugar, imported wine, beer, and hard liquor. Hard liquor. Oh my no! God, not that. How will we get drunk while our while house floods now? Sir? How will we get drunk while our house floods now? Just going to make your own hooch, that's all. While the, the Biden administration has said it supports workers' rights, a prolonged economic stoppage will almost certainly cause higher prices and potentially supply chain backups week for election day. President Joe Biden has actually said he would not involve the tar in not invoke the tar tape will not invoke the Taft Hartley Act, which would force longshore workers back to work. No, Ooh. Biden told reporters on Sunday when asked whether he would interview it on a potential strike because it's collective bargaining, and I don't believe in Taft Hartley. Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, didn't did not comment on the strike until Wednesday because there's nothing to say. <laughs> Say, really, saying in a statement that those on the picket lines play a vital role in transporting essential goods across America. So they deserve a fair share of these record profits. Industry profits topped $40 billion from 2020 to 23 as shipping rates soared during and after the pandemic. So these shipping companies are charging rates, astronomical rates, to cover their billion costs. $40 profits is ridiculous. And and the workers didn't make any extra money. Exactly. She also called out former President Defendant Jay Trump's record on labor, claiming he pointed union busters to the NLRB, which is National Labor Relations Board, and recently said striking workers should be fired. However, Trump claimed a statement Tuesday that a strike happened because of the inflation. But uh, uh, yeah, the strike happened because of the inflation. Just, just don't even talk to Trump about anything. He doesn't know anything works. American workers should be able to negotiate for better wages, he continued. Well, he's right about that. Blaming blaming the strike on inflation for the strike. It makes no fucking sense. Yeah, yeah, inflation. Everybody's got inflation. Everybody should go on strike because of inflation. What does that even mean? <laughs> Let's make inflation work by going on strike. <laughs> I don't know. On Wednesday, Biden starkly warned against the man-made disaster caused by the ongoing port strike and urged two sides to become to an agreement to avoid significant economic impacts. Natural disasters are incredibly consequential. Last we, the last thing we need on top of that is a man-made disaster. What's going on at the ports? He told reporters that joined base Andrews. We're going to 
get pushed back already. We're hearing from the folks regionally that they're having trouble getting product they need of the, because of the pork strike. So yes, uh, U.S. Uh, people are panic buying uh, toilet paper, which is never going to be affected by this pork strike. At one even tiny little, as we'll go, as we'll go a little bit further, it has not. In our next section, when we talk about words, this strike has not affected the toilet paper supply one iota. <laughs> anyway, those are your updates on the strikes in the United States, the Longshoremen Union. Back to you. And as everyone knows, the solution to stopping a strike is maybe taking that $40 billion profit you make a year and giving it to the people working on the docks. What a concept. Also, scabs are the worst people oh. in the world, along with bigots and all other hateful people. Well, there won't be any scabs in this strike. It's just going to be yeah. shut down ports. Which is just a shame, really. That would be really, Four, just really like, hard to get I can't even that think. Many. Profits, right? $40 billion in profits. Not, I make $40 billion and then some of it gets paid out. Like, no, we make $40 billion after we do everything else and all the costs, that forty billion just right here on my lap. I don't think anyone well, should be making profits that high. I was thinking about Port of Baltimore. Ridiculous. I was thinking about Port of Baltimore, which just got run in full time again after that ship disaster. Yeah. And now everybody's going on strike after you know we're not employed for nine months. Well, they have the they have the pressure to put it on, I guess. So. I can't imagine you just lived off unemployment for nine months and now you go back to work and then you're on a strike again after you just finally start getting decent paychecks. That, that's just me. It's going to be a hardship for those families. Well, either way, good luck with that. And uh, hopefully you guys understand what a bidet is so that we can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's National Boyfriend's Day. buy all of the toilet paper. <laughs> well, uh, more things I can get angry about is uh, yeah, impulse Georgia. Impulse buy bananas. Georgia doing shitty things. Uh, or surprise. bananas either. This is from um, AP News by, I don't know if it's written by anybody. Do we have a byline here? It's written by nobody. So... Thanks whoever wrote this article, right, no maybe they'll credit you next time. This is from Tbilisi, Georgia. The Speaker of the Georgian Parliament signed into law today on October 3rd, a bill that severely curtails LGBTQ plus rights in the country and mirrors legislation adopted in our neighboring Russia. Yeah, you know, Russia is a great um, example of LGBTQ mm. rights. Chalva Papul Shilvi, the parliament speaker, said on social media that the legislation does not reflect current, temporary, changing ideas and ideology, but is based on common sense, historical experience, and centuries-old Christian, Georgian, and European values. Anyways, Georgian President Salom Zorobikili had refused to sign the bill and returned it to Parliament on Wednesday, October 2nd. It was introduced by the governing Georgian Dream Party and approved by lawmakers last month. I wish it stayed a dream. I wish it was just a little nightmare that they could have kept to themselves instead of making us live in it. The bill includes bans on same-sex marriage, oh god, not that, adoptions by same-sex couples, children getting a home? How dare they let them stay in the orphanage? public endorsement, and depictions of LGBTQ plus relations. Those girls are holding hands, call the police, and people in the media. It also bans gender affirming care, God forbid I don't want a mustache, and changing gender designations in official documents. You can't tell me what pronouns to use because I'm Georgian, so I, it's protected by law that I have to have the same pronouns for in my entire life. This law protects the rights of citizens. Mm. No, it doesn't. Including freedom of expression so that the rights of others are not valid, violated, which is the essence and idea of true democracy. What the hell is he talking about? You're including freedom of expression by saying you're not allowed to do anything. <laughs> you have the freedom to not do your expression. You're welcome. Parliament gave the legislation its final approval in Georgia. 
as largely conservative country where the Orthodox Church wields significant influence, prepares to vote in the parliamentary election. The law has been widely seen as effort by the governing party to shore up support among conservative groups. It was decreed, decried by human rights advocates and LGBTQ activists who said it further marginalized an already vulnerable community. I feel so sorry for everyone in Georgia. By signing the law, Georgian Dream have taken homophobia to a new level, and this is a political and institutional homophobia, said Anna Havadze, an activist with the Tbilisi Pride, an LGBTQ plus advocacy group. Georgian Dream's aim is to fabricate problems, I agree, ahead of the election to distract people from their failure to solve issues that actually matter, like unemployment, education, and healthcare. I'm dying, I have no job, and I'm stupid, but hey, at least nobody can tell me they're gay. Havadze told the Associated Press. No, they didn't. That's my quote. They didn't. Not, not quote. Tavadze just said the thing about. Yeah, distracting. That was my quote. The law has drawn comparisons with Russia, where the Kremlin has been highlighting what it calls traditional family values. Russian authorities in the last decade have banned public endorsement of non traditional sexual relations and introduced laws against gender affirming care, among other measures. Its Supreme Court effectively outlawed LGBTQ activism so they can't even scream at the top of their lungs about how they want rights by labeling what authorities call the LGBTQ movement operating in Russia as extremist organization and banning it. Well, I mean, if, you're, if your line of acceptable behavior is like here, right? Anything outside of it is gonna be labeled extremist. <laughs> you're not in this one little box, you're an extremist. In Georgia, the LGBTQ community has struggled even before the legislation was introduced. Demonstrations and violent outbursts against LGBTQ plus people have been common, and last year hundreds of opponents of gay rights stormed an LGBTQ festival in Georgian capital. Tbilisi forcing the event's cancellation. Great. This, I, I wouldn't call them opponents of gay rights, I would call them bigots myself. This year, tens of thousands marched in Tbilisi to promote traditional family values. You know, whatever that is. Put a label on it and then you can tell everyone you're not doing it so that they, you can hate them more. A day after Parliament gave its final approval to the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, transgendered actor and model Kesari Avarmitze was stabbed to death in her apartment. Wow! Murder! What traditional values? Murdering people you don't like. Right advocates have worried that the bill would spoke, stoke more violence. Well, don't worry about it. It's already happened. Papua Shibli, the parliament speaker, said that by not signing the bill, President Zoro Bliklivli and the Georgian opposition did not have enough courage to openly express their opinion regarding this law. Some analysts say parts of the Georgian opposition are walking a fine, thin line ahead of the October 26th election between condemning the move to curtail LGBTQ plus rights and not wanting to alienate some voters. Zoro Bliklivli has yeah, long been at odds. Sorry? I said forget voters. Yeah, the only time you worry about voters, voters. Is when you're running for election. Yeah, yeah exactly. Zorbi Clevy has long been at odds with the governing party and vetoed a foreign influence law adopted by Parliament earlier this year. He was overridden by Parliament where Georgian Dream dominates. Yeah, see, this is the problem when you have a majority in Parliament. They just say, I don't care what you want, we're going to pass it anyways. The measure requires media and non-governmental organizations to register as per perusing the interests of a foreign power. Reminder, this is the law that the EU threatened, saying if you pass this law, you will never join the EU because it goes against the entire idea of the EU. And I think the LGBT bill is also going against that, so they're kind of never joined the EU at this point. And uh, good luck, I guess you can join Russia's uh, Federation of Hateful People, uh, and you can go hang out with them. I'm sure, because Georgia, Georgians love Russia. They don't love oh, Russia. Oh, I'm sure they do. That's why they made and, their own separate country, right? Yeah, exactly. And they're getting completely played by their their far-right government, who's dominating the parliament, and yep. just saying, we're going to make ourselves closer and closer to Russia, and you guys aren't going to notice until we are literally ruled by Putin. Those opposing the law compared it to exactly. similar legislation in Russia, which is routinely used to press dissent accused the governing party of acting in concert with Moscow, jeopardizing Georgia's chances of joining the European Union.
The South Caucasus nation of 3.7 million formally applied to join the EU in 2022 after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Huh, that makes it sound like they don't want to be ruled by Russia. How odd that they're trying to be ruled by them at the same time. But the bloc called its ascension in response to foreign influence law and froze some of its financial support. The United States imposed sanctions on dozens of Georgian officials in response to the law. Georgian Dream was set up by Bidzina Ivanshvili, a shadowy billionaire. Great! A shadowy billionaire who made his fortune in Russia, so a Russian pawn is what it sounds like, and served briefly as mm. Georgia's served, sorry, served briefly as Georgia's prime Oligarch. minister in 2012. It promised to restore civil rights and reset relations with Moscow so that they can be part of the Russian Federation later, which fought the brief war with Georgia in 2008 over the breakaway province of South Ossetia, and Russia then recognized the independence of South Ossetia and another breakaway Georgian province, Abkhazia, and established military bases there. Many Georgians backed Ukraine as Kyiv battled Russia's invasion in 2022, but the Georgian government abstained from joining sanctions against Moscow, barred dozens of Kremlin critics from entering the country, and accused the West of trying to drag Georgia into an open conflict with Russia. You did it all on your own, buddy by not want to be part of Russia. The opposition has accused the governing party of steering the country into Russia's orbit to the determinant of its European aspiration. I'm just saying, if in a 50 years from now, there's a Russian Federation of Georgia and Hungary and they're all hanging out together, I'm gonna be here and say I told you so. Because uh, unless they turn themselves around and kick all these uh, Russian loving politicians out of their influence, that's what's gonna happen here. That's the only option here. Unfortunately, we do live in a, a us versus them kind of dichotomy right now. And you're either part of the EU and the US and all those, or you're part of Russia and hating everybody and telling people what to do and dictatorships. So, yep. be a little black and white about it. Good luck, Georgia. Hopefully you can Every uh, kick the Georgian dream out and overturn all these stupid laws they're passing to make people hate their lives. Thanks. Onto your Thursday's 13. Yeah. I'm just disappointed. Yeah, I have nothing seriously, to say. Seriously, it's, it's actually the anniversary of Germany reuniting, so. Uh, the Weimar Republic. They, they've had like two. No, no, Berlin. Georgia's had like two generations of. Two generations of not being part of the Soviet Union, so I yeah. guess they just. Oh! They Let's be already. like them. The good old days our grandparents loved and all your grandparents that loved their shortages and their sameness of everything. And having and to the, the sell their bodies the so that they could buy bread, you know. Yeah, the bleakness of communist Soviet Union was not that exciting. No matter how much your grandparents might romanticize it, I can't imagine. Anyway, today's Thursday 13 is everyone or both. Words, oh, I, don't, I don't, there's no name for these words, by the way. I can't think of a name for them, so I call them lonely words. Words that only used in one situation are never used any other way, right? Yeah. In other words. So, without without further ado, which <laughs> one of the words that's at the top of it is ado. Ado. Nobody uses this word other than to say, without further ado. I challenge, your friend. unless you're doing the Shakespeare play, much ado about nothing. Ado, that's a different word. That's A D. EUA, whatever that means. Bye bye. It's a different word, different meaning. A do means a whole lot of fuss. But it's only word, it's only used when you say, without further ado. You never use it any other time. When do you ever use it? Never. Not the French word for goodbye. A do. <laughs> it's just spelled differently. Okay. We covered that. So, my. Uh, Without further ado, we get on to number two, which is caboodle. You'll never see a caboodle by itself. It's always with a kit. You see a kit with a caboodle. In other words, in America, it's a saying, bring the whole thing. Bring all your stuff. In other words, you'll say, bring the kit and caboodle. Or, look, Jim brought the whole kit and caboodle. Although you will see a kit by itself, like a shaving kit or whatever, your gun cleaning kit or whatever. You'll never see a caboodle. Nobody ever says, hey, I brought the caboodle. Nobody ever says that because caboodle the kit, but I the is caboodle, never used you know? a lot. Yeah. The kit and caboodle. Never see the caboodle. <clears throat> Fill in this blank. Trials and... Tribulations. What's the next word? Oh. 
Exactly. You never see the word tribulations by itself, ever. Boy, we had a lot of tribulations today. Nope, you never, never hear anybody say that. I'm going to start using tribulations. Boy, today was nothing but tribulations. You never hear tribulations, except with trials. Today's trials and... It's kind of uh, struggles and strife, kind of the same thing. Yeah. Trials and tribulations. Struggles and strife. He said, you do hear strife by itself. Cheveled. Have you ever seen anybody that's cheveled? Yeah. Nope. But you've seen people that are disheveled for sure. Here. Yes. I'm dis I'm disheveled. You know, your hair is all messy. Your hair is a that's disheveled. But you never see somebody in a suit walking up there, you know, all the tuxedo and say, wow, you know. Uh, Rob De Niro looks very shoveled tonight for the Academy Awards. No, you ever see that. Nobody's ever shoveled. You've never been shoveled in your life. But you've been disheveled several times. You wake up in the morning disheveled. It takes several hours to get shoveled. So, more shoveledness. Never see the word mumbo without the word jumbo. Mumbo jumbo, yeah. Boy, that's a lot of... Uh, you never hear... You never hear... Boy, let's hit some mumbo. You might hear mumbo, but you hear mumbo. <coughs> you never see you mumbo. See jumbo by jumbo. Itself. You'll see jumbo. Yeah. Oh yeah, you'll see jumbo like jumbo eggs or whatever. Jumbo. Yeah. Mumbo jumbo is just a. It's a, it's a term for people that are just talking nonsense. Like Donald Trump sure talks a lot of mumbo jumbo. Anyway, innocuous. Oh. Things are innocuous, meaning yeah. har harmless, but nothing's ever, ever, nothing's ever innocuous. That thing is really innocuous. Get away! You never hear that. You never hear not innocuous. You hear innocuous. Yeah. These are words that are modified. The actual words. Innocuous is a word, but you never hear it. <laughs> iota. The base measurement of an iota is one, right? You never hear of two iotas, several iotas, you never hear five million iotas. Boy, I've got seven gazillion iotas of that. However, you only hear iota measured when people are saying they don't have anything. They say, hey, I don't even have one iota of that. Yeah. It's always a measurement of having nothing. Iota. An iota is I don't have anything. Ah, you have you do not have one iota of common sense in your brain. Yes, I do. I have actually two iotas of common sense in my brain, for your information. <laughs> but you never hear it in its plural form. You only hear iota as in one. Isn't that interesting? I think it is. If you don't find this interesting, I apologize. I think this is interesting as hell. Anyway. <clears throat> <clears throat> what kind of idiots are there? Go ahead. What's the first modifier when you think of idiot? What kind of idiot? I have no idea. I can't think now. What kind of it? Blithering! The oh, only kind blithering. of idiot there is is a blithering idiot. And you never hear the word blithering any other time. Why that guy's a real blithering bus driver, isn't he? <laughs> that guy's a blithering airplane pilot, isn't he? Nope. <laughs> He's a blithering idiot. The only kind of... <laughs> the only adjective, yeah. The only time you ever hear... The only time you ever hear blithering, idiot is immediately after it. Blithering. Blithering? The only kind of idiot it, there is to be. Morbidly what? Obese. Morbidly what? Exactly. You never hear morbidly with any other word except obese. Boy, that guy is morbidly handsome. No. <laughs> Boy, that woman is morbidly, morbidly pretty. She's morbidly six foot two. No. Morbidly only goes with obese, and it's usually for somebody that can't even, like, move. You know? yeah. Morbid is it's one of those words that's one of them creepy words. It's a creepy word, but it only for some reason it's only used with obese, not morbidly fat, morbidly yeah. enormous. It's just with obese. Weird, huh? Scarum. Scarum. What the hell is scarum? I have no idea, but... When things are scattered all over the place, they are harem scarum all over the place. What? Well, everything's all harem scarum. Yeah. I know what a harem is, but I don't know what a scarum is. <laughs> and you never hear scarum by itself. 
Have you ever been whelmed? You you brought this one up the other day. Yeah. This is one of yours. I've never been whelmed. 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 It, you've never been whelmed. You've been overwhelmed. You've been underwhelmed, but you've never been whelmed. <laughs> it just... <laughs> <laughs> Boy, everybody asks you how you are today, you just say, eh, I'm just whelmed. Not overwhelmed, just whelmed. I'm just whelmed. It is a word. Whelmed is a word. You'll never hear it. And well, of course, along with that is gruntled. Overgruntled, disconcerted, disgruntled. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's ever been gruntled. Yeah. You've been disgruntled for sure. I'm disgruntled all the time. I wake up in the morning disgruntled, but I'm never, I was never really. You're going to ask me, how you feeling? I go, I'm pretty gruntled today. I was whelmed earlier, but now I'm gruntled. You never hear her gruntled by itself and it, again we probably should start using these words just to have our own languages right their own yeah. modern language of words that we can accept and of course in that same vein our 13th word is scathed unscathed. so nobody gets through this life unscathed however it's possible that you can be scathed <laughs> they're scathing yeah. but i've never heard anybody being scathed Right? I've been that was scared. a scathing review. Oh my god, I've been scared! <laughs> well, at least you got through that unscathed. Well, I've been scared today and I've been grundled and I'm definitely whelmed. So, there's your 13. Back to you. Hopefully, it wasn't too long for Thursday 13. I wish I wish those politicians in Georgia were some scathed. There you go. You can get all ready. <laughs> Well, as we were talking I was all about getting scathed last night. Ado, which is the French totally word for scathed. goodbye. We're gonna talk about yep. why French language music is having some great success on Spotify. This is by David Morquand on Euronews Culture. Alors on danse. Across music, podcasts, and audiobooks, more Spotify listeners are turning toward French language content. The likes of Strome. Indala, Aya Nakamura are seducing wider audiences and crossing borders like never before. English speaking and Latin artists may still dominate the charts, but many other languages are making strong impressions on Spotify. Portuguese, Italian, Hindi, especially the latter, through the growing phenomenon of iPop or Indian pop, are breaking new ground. However, it's French speaking artists that are making the biggest mark, winning over an ever growing worldwide audience. Hardly surprising coming off the bat of the Paris Olympics, with the closing ceremony propelling four French artists, Kavinsky, Phoenix, Air, and Angele, to the top of Shazam's most searched songs. Kavinsky's Night Call became the song to be Shazam the most times in a single day on the famed music recognition app, and 10.50 on Sunday, 11 August, was the most shazam unit in history. Well, I don't want to be a hipster, but I listened to Night Call by Kavinsky before he was on the Paris Olympics, okay? I knew that song before he was... <laughs> Not half bad. Now, we have additional numbers which speak for themselves. A digital service Spotify has unveiled new data regarding listening habits. Since 2019, French language music streams have surged by 94%. Wow, in between August 2023 and July 2024, over 100 million people worldwide, or around one-sixth of Spotify's global users, listen to French language content on the platform. North America loves French singer Indela and Le Cowboys Fragants. Anna Kimura, Indela and rapper D.I.M.S. are dominating the Asian Pacific scene, while in South Africa and the Middle East, R&B stars like K. Case, Gazo, Daju, and Sulking are proving to be incredibly popular. Belgian star Strome continues to dominate streams around the world, especially in Latin America. The to date 90, so sorry, 39 million Spotify list users have added at least one track sung in French to a personal playlist. And in the span of 12 months, more than 83 million hours of French language music resonated in more than 180 countries on Spotify. I mean, I've been listening to M83. They have French in there, and, there, and they are French. But I don't think they're pop music. They're, they're not pop music. In case you're wondering, the platform has veiled the top five most streamed French language tracks worldwide. 
Number one, Patrick Watson, Je te laisserai de mots. That's from Canada, so that's French Canadian. Indila, dernière danse. That's from France. Dromé, alors on danse. That's Belgium. Soul King and Gat et Caso, Casanova from France. And Yame, Begane, a color show, also from France. So what's behind the growing international appeal for artists singing in the language of Molière? Without physical constraints and a wider variety of music can meet with their audiences around the globe. It also could be down to Spotify's efforts to boost the export of French-speaking music and podcasts through programs like Radar. But in large part, the phenomena seems to be driven to driven the diversity of sound and riches, richness of the continent by hit makers from countries like France, Quebec, Belgium, and Algeria. It's really the art architecture, the very philosophy of streaming and its technological fluidity that enables repertoires to be discovered by potentially anyone, anytime, anywhere, in high volumes, Bruno Colo, Spotify's director of international music, told the AFP, Asia Agence France Press. Colo highlights the exceptional talent of the artist and states the listeners for whom understanding the language of song you're listening to is much less of an issue than in the past, he adds. That is a trend that is only beginning. I mean, people who listen to K-pop and Japanese music have also always felt this way, right? I don't know what they're talking about, but the music they're making is trans... It's trans... Uh, I don't want to say transformational, but it, it goes beyond the borders of the language, right? Because the music matches what they're talking about, in so, on most cases, you know, you really get the feeling for it and you don't need to know what they're actually talking about. Jeremy Elric, and also you can just look up the translations. There's people out there that will translate entire K-pop and J-pop. cultural. And, yeah. And the reality is humans don't really, aren't that really that different from each other and the feelings we feel are global, right? Mm -hmm. Love lost, fear, anger, all these, you know, basic emotions that are shared through music can be felt even when you don't know what they're saying. Jeremy Elric, Vice President and Head of Music Content on Spotify, adds that it's a credit to French-speaking artists and the power of this music. These artists feature their peers from all over the world, studying Angeles' duo with Dua Lipa on Fever, Naya Nakamura and Stormzy's Plus Jamai. Plus Jamai. So, you are the most, here's a long list, another list for Thursday, where we're going to tell you all the French-speaking artists by region. So in Europe, we got Jules, Gazo, Renoi, Ninho, and PLK. In North America, it's Les Cowboys Fragants, Patrick Watson, Stormé, Soldia, and Indila. Latin America has Stromé, Patrick Watson, Video Club, Indila, and Adele Castillon. Castillon. In South Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, because for some reason those guys are getting grouped together. We've got Taisi, Ninho, Gazo, Daju, and Soul King. In the Asian Pacific, you've got Indila, Patrick Watson, Aya Nakamura, GIMS or GIMS, and Strome. So, have you added any of these French-speaking artists to your playlist? And if not, well, maybe you should check them out and see if you like what they're playing. Reminder, this is mostly pop music. There's definitely French artists out there like Kavinsky and M83 and of course Daft Punk who are... I, I, it's kind of dumb. Uh, I had this argument when I was going on a walk the other day. What makes something French? Or what makes something Korean, right? Is it the fact that the people making the music come from the place of France or Algeria or Quebec, right? Or is it because they're speaking French in the music, right? Or they're speaking Korean or they're speaking Japanese or they're speaking German, right? What makes the genre the genre? I would argue that because of cultural markers, if you're French and even you're making music that is French music, even if it's not in French, right? Because there's, I would say that being French makes you make a certain type of music. But maybe that's just me and I just don't want to label everything just through language. But I think here we're definitely uh -huh. labeling it completely through music, uh, language. If it's in French, it's French. Um, music, even if they're not the same genre, right? Because Kalvinsky is not the same as 
Nakamura. They're not making the same music at all. But they do speak French, you know? So, eh. It's really hard to write a, write a genre. Genres are more fluid anyways, but that's my story on French music and mm. on Spotify. And, uh... I separate genres by the type of uh, musical instruments that are in. Yeah. Like, if it's got a pedal steel guitar, it's country. Yeah. If it's got a saxophone, it's jazz. No, I don't know. <laughs> it's got more than one horn, it's jazzy. I don't know. Okay, then. That's it. I did the state okay. history, I guess, around to? Yeah. All right, I sent you a video. It's about three and a half minutes. Okay, yeah, I've got it. I don't it. know if I'll play the like whole thing, but I would start it. Okay. This day in history, in 1862, the Battle of Corinth, an American Civil War conflict that ended in a decisive Union victory over Confederate forces in northeastern Mississippi, began. So, 1862. 1866, on October 3rd, <coughs> which is today, the... <laughs> In 1863, through the mediation of Napoleon III, Italy obtained Venetia in the Treaty of Vienna. All right. They can get their Venetian blinds then, I guess. 1889, German journalist and pacifist Karl Van Ossetsky, who was awarded the 1935 Nobel Prize for Peace while incarcerated in a concentration camp, was born in Hamburg. So he's born, his birthday is today, 1889. 1918, Prince Maximilian of Baden, internationally known for his modern his moderation and honorability, was appointed Chancellor of Germany. 1935, Italian forces led by Emilio di Bono, under orders from Benito Mussolini, invaded Abyssinia, Ethiopia, in hopes of building a new Roman Empire. Well, that didn't work out so great. 1936, American collegiate gridiron football coach John Heisman died. He was considered one of the greatest innovators of the game, and the Heisman Trophy is named after him. And the first Heisman Trophy was awarded the following season. 1941, or actually, I think in 1936 was the first Heisman Trophy. 1941, the Maltese Falcon. John Huston's adaptation of Deschel Hammett's famed 1930 novel had its world premiere and is considered by some to be the greatest detective movie ever made. 1945, the Maid Johnson Bill, keeping atomic research a secret and established security regulations were introduced into the U.S. Congress. Although it never became law, the debate over the proposed legislation resulted in the passage of the Atomic Energy Act in 1946. 1952, the first British atomic weapons test called Hurricane was successfully conducted aboard the frigate HMS Plym. That's P L Y M. Plym. HMS Plym. I thought that was two ends. It's my spotty eyes. <laughs> 1960, the Andy Griffith Show debuted on American television and was an immediate success. 1961, the Dick Van Dyke Show, a pioneer in the sitcom genre began airing on CBS. So, two, two TV shows debuted a year apart. Dick Van Dyke's still alive. 1969, the American singer and songwriter Gwen Stefani was born. She became known as the singer for the rock ska, ska band No Doubt before starting a solo career. 1995, one of the most sensational trials in U.S. history, ended as a jury found O.J. Simpson not guilty of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Of course, that was today, was the O.J. Simpson trial, which seemed at the time to take seven or eight years. But it only took a few months, and it was on TV every stinking day. It was just not a great time to be alive. 2004, American actress Janet Lee passed away at the age of 77. She was best remembered for her performances in Albert Hitchcock's Psycho, in which her character suffered one of the most, cinema's most memorable and shocking deaths. Yeah, up, in the, up until then, she was just, oh, the story about this young girl who's having an affair and she gets away from her hometown to get away from it all and checks into Norman Bates' hotel and gets murdered. Terrible. 
Psycho, one of the most upsetting movies of all time. <clears throat> 1990, Germany on this day. Germany reunified after four decades of Cold War division and with the pressure from the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev agreed to, to a unified Germany within NATO, leading to Germany's reunification on this day in 1990. So happy anniversary to Germany getting back together. We were not big fans of any of your previous work, but hopefully you get your shit together this time. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's everybody said in 1990. Oh, do we really want Germany back together? Anyway, Saint Francis of Assisi is our featured biography. He's an Italian saint. He went to saint school to become a saint. He was born in either 1181 or 1182. Says so we don't know what year he was born, but we do know what day he died. He died October 3rd, 1226, in Assisi. So anniversary of that. Other birthdays today, Gore Vidal, American writer, born 1925. He would be 99 today. Steve Reich, American composer, born in 1936, or Reich, my C-H. Eddie Cochran, American singer and musician. Yeah, Eddie Cochran. He's sung Summertime Blues. I uh, love that song, Summertime Blues. Uh, Eddie Cochran, happy birthday. 1954, Al Sharpton. American minister, politician, and civil rights activist. Al Sharpton turning a, he looks a lot older. He's turning 70 today, but it's me. He seems like he's a lot older. Gwen Stefani, we already covered her birthday in 1969. And what day is it today? It is only two things today. It is National Techies Day and National Boyfriend Day. So get your boyfriend a present. It's National Boyfriend Day. And National Techies Day, well, I guess I'm a techie because I had that after my job title, several jobs. I've been technician into my job. So I'm a techie, so it's my day. Ha ha ha. Uh, so there's all, your, uh, there's all your days for today, all two of them, <laughs> for October 3rd, 2024. And before we watch Psycho, I don't know. Before, before techies. <laughs> well, this has been Allison here. I'm also a techie. I'm doing tech stuff this whole time during this show. So right. let's celebrate our techies out there who understand how all of the things work and they know how to fix it, even if it might take five hours to fix. So we'll <laughs> see you tomorrow for our Friday news dump. If there's any stories we haven't covered and you want us to talk about and share our opinions on, Please comment down below or share on our social media or wherever you can find us. And we'll we look be at dumping. it and see if we want to talk about it. So um, don't forget to subscribe to the Ali and Raj channel if you're not already. And of course, turn on those notifications so you know when we go live. Like tomorrow's Friday news dump. Like this video. And uh, let's go ahead to our mic drop moment. Psycho no. features one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history. When the original Psycho Interesting Psycho zooming came of out, the mouth. Jamie Lee Curtis is done like that. And Janet Lee 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 mommy. an inside look at the making of Alfred Hitchcock's horror classic. I don't think I did the shower curtain business any good, <laughs> except the ones that I've signed. <laughs> in Sent a time some shower of immense curtain. censorship in Hollywood, Hitchcock found a way uh -huh. to create terror using the power of imagination. Am I acting as if there's something wrong? And the reason that it was so effectively um, portrayed was because at that time we had censorship. Uh, everything had to be cleared through a board. Yeah. And you code. could not show nudity. You could not show mm -hmm. graphic violence. We all go a little mad sometimes. So what Mr. Hitchcock did was bring the audience into the picture so much that what they saw, their own mind uh, imagined much worse than you can show. Much worse. And that's, I think, was the secret the of Psycho. Genius. Do you go out with friends? Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. People, sophisticated, knowledgeable people say, 
oh, I remember that picture. I saw the blood spurting out and the knife, oh, and you know. And of course, they didn't see any of it because we couldn't. The <laughs> wizardry of Mr. Hitchcock, who could bring you to a point, a frenzy, and then let you take off. Just that music. And go up from there with your imagination. You of... Marion's early checkout from Bates Motel shocked weak, audiences weak, as weak, Janet weak. only ended up being featured in a third of Psycho, despite being one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. It was so funny how the number of people who came up to me and said, you know, we never really thought that you were dead. We, we thought you were, you know, you would somehow you got out of the car, out of the trunk, and you'd come back in the All picture. Right. Is, that, is that hysterical? While it may <laughs> seem extreme, She's Janet dead. confirmed to E.T. that this legendary scene made her give up showers forever. It's not PR. It is true. I stopped taking showers. I will not wow. go into a shower. Wow. Unless there's She's no a bather, bather until the end. The doors are open. I have something right close by, and I'm facing the door. Put bubble wrap and on the floor. You know, there's no curtain. The floor looks like a No one's floor. walking in on me. But that is the truth. The shower scene became so iconic, it was wow. later featured as part of an attraction at Universal Studios. And how about this? One of its performers was Curb Your Enthusiasm star Cheryl Hines. In my first acting job, I got stabbed in the shower, recreating the psycho shower scene at Universal Studios. It was nice. I had a flesh-colored bodysuit, and then I just shower in front of hundreds of people a day. Wow. And, get and now she's married to Bobby Kennedy Jr. <laughs> Really? While Janet knew Hitchcock was making something yeah. special, <laughs> no another idea form of psycho. <laughs> that it did. I don't think in the making of any movie prior to its release you can really say, oh, this is going to go through the roof. We believed in the talent and magical powers of Mr. Hitchcock, which proved to be correct. Uh, and so, in that way, I think we all felt we were creating something good. I don't think. No, I don't think it ever crossed anyone's mind that it would have that kind of impact. Never does. Sometimes you just make stuff to make stuff. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels. Toxic Alley. History of Gravy and Scratchy Old Records.